So we're actually wrapping up our series, More Than Meets the Eye, although I am going to miss that picture after this week. Right? But the, uh, you know, the point of this whole message series has really been around this idea that Jesus makes what appears to be an incredible promise, that he has come so we could have life, and as he said, so we could have life to the full. And the first week, we, we really dug into what that have life to the full means. And, you know, it means that kind of classic thing that we so often think about with Jesus, that it's about eternal life. But he was also abundantly clear that it was about a different life here. The ability to have an impact beyond what we might expect. To have a life that is rich and abundant and satisfying. And I think that that, excuse me, that goes hand in hand with having a life that is purposeful and actually serves those in need. I ask that we just kind of embrace that truth, that, that there are things that we can do and there are ways that we can touch people around us and, and that we would be willing to step out and do that. But as we've talked about throughout the series, in order to do that, we've got to be healthy ourselves. Right? We've got to be be willing to take the time to get healthy. And we've talked about a few things these past few weeks that help us to do that, to, to be more present in our lives. And I think that means not just being present with ourselves, being present with those who are around us. And also recognizing that there are hurts in our lives that we need to deal with, that if we've got dependencies, we've got chemical dependencies, we've got alcohol dependencies, we need to deal with those things. If we've got pain from our childhoods or from relationships or from life that we get help in dealing with those things. And I think that if we're willing to do that work, that gets us started in living that life like Jesus describes that is so full and so satisfying. But those things alone, I think, are are not quite enough. Because I think that as we look at our lives, even if we've kind of got many of those things under control, I think oftentimes we look at our lives and we're like, well, my life doesn't feel like Jesus seems to be describing. It doesn't feel like it's quite there. And again, it could be small things, you know, things you just kind of really wanted to do that never came together, or things can feel really off the rails and you're not there at all, or at least you feel like you're not there at all. And I think that's, a, that's something we've got to really be aware of, that as we kind of examine ourselves, examine our lives, we can be very tempted to only see the things that are wrong. Realizing that we all have many, many good things in our lives, and it's important to embrace those good things. And then from the the joy and satisfaction of the good things that we have, we then use that to move forward to a more complete life. That it's not about trying to fill holes, right? It's about recognizing what we have, what we can build on, And then from there, being able to have a life that is satisfying and impactful and meaningful. Not because we're trying to prove we're good enough, but but, but because God has already declared you good enough, loved, and accepted. And we do it from that point of strength, not trying to shore ourselves up. But then as we do that, as we do the work to be healthier, as we, we start to kind of maybe get that kind of more positive outlook on ourselves, Oftentimes, we we still can't seem to find the path to where we want to be, to that life like Jesus describes. And I think that that's the thing I really want to talk about today, is that when we're not really living that life like we want to, that life that feels satisfying and full, I think we're just kind of like, I just don't know what to do. How do I get there? And I think what it really comes down to, and my point for today, is direction of travel. And the reason I say that is because I think most of us want to live an impactful, meaningful life. I think for most of us, that's our intention. Our intention is to arrive at that destination of an impactful, meaningful life. But somehow we can wake up day after day not really feeling like we're quite getting there. And so there's something that just seems to keep us from reaching that intended destination. And I think there's a quote that I think gives us a hint on what we need to do here. 
Now, this comes from uh, Andy Stanley. He's the lead pastor of a large church down in Georgia. And he quotes this often. Direction, not intention, determines your destination. Right? Like, I could intend to go to New York, but if I start driving west, I'm not going to get there. Right? Or I can intend to go to California, but if I never start the car or start walking, I'm not going to get there. And so that's the thing that, that I think we really need to embrace, that if we're going to have a life like Jesus has described, this impactful, meaningful life, purposeful life he's talked about, then simply intending to have that kind of life, just wanting that kind of life, isn't going to create it. To achieve that life, to reach that destination of that life that Jesus says we can have, we need to take steps in that direction. And the first steps to doing that are the things that we've been talking about, doing the work to start to become healthier. Those are absolutely the first steps. Because as we do those things, again, we get healthier, we get more in touch with ourselves, we get more in touch with the world around us, and I think we get a greater sense of God's presence in our lives. And if we were to stop right there, if we were only to do the things we've talked about the past few weeks, our lives would be better if we would really do the work to, to deal with those things we're carrying with us, because just about all of us are carrying something with us. Our lives would be better, but if we stopped there, I don't think we'd achieve the life that Jesus has described. That it's about more than just being well. Because remember that last week, as we talked about, we kind of used this analogy of the athlete. And that athletes have to go out there and they have to train and they have to rest but the Apostle Paul, when talking about an athlete, encouraged us to do something. He encouraged us to run with purpose in every step. Run with purpose in every step. In other words, what he was encouraging us to do is to intentionally, within our lives, start moving in a way consistent with a life that is purposeful, impactful, and meaningful. But the thing is, I think that, I think we often get stuck. That's this idea of, well, I want to move towards a life that's purposeful and impactful and meaningful. But we don't know what to do. And so since we don't know what to do, we start to do nothing. We just kind of wait for it to show up somehow. That somehow it'll just, I'll just know. Somehow I'll just know. I'll just wait right here. And somehow I'll just know. But we've, we've said that there is a leading available, right? That, that, there, that God can lead us. We, we talked a lot about that last week, that we start to become more aware of this leading from God. But, but here's the thing. It's fairly rare that God's leading happens like in the movies. We generally don't wake up with an epiphany going, whoa, this is everything I'm supposed to do. That's exactly where I'm supposed to go. These are all the steps I have to take to get there. That kind of... That doesn't normally happen. What happens is, is often discomfort. You know, you might get a nudging that you're kind of supposed to, maybe I'll go try that thing, or I'll go help out at this thing, or I'll go show up at that thing. But oftentimes what happens, and this has certainly been true in my life, is I reach a point where I feel a discontent, that just kind of staying where I'm at doesn't feel right. That just trying to remain here feels like I'm just not quite where I'm supposed to be. But what happens is that those sort of things don't feel definitive. Right? A nudging to go try something or a discontent with, eh, it just kind of feel not right. We go, well, that doesn't feel very certain to me. I want certainty. I want to know exactly where I'm going and exactly how I'm supposed to get there. And... Um, Certainty doesn't seem to come. And what happens is, is we don't have certainty. Our natural reaction to an absence of certainty is fear. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know where I'm supposed to go. And fear creates paralysis. 
We often can use the phrase analysis paralysis, where I am so busy trying to find the exact destination and the exact route and all the things that might happen along the way that I think about things a lot. I intend to do something a lot, but I'm so busy analyzing it that I never take a step towards it. And that's one of the key things that we need to do, that we need to be willing to overcome our fears and overcome our paralysis. If we will step into our fears, that's what enables us to start moving. And I will... I don't think this will be a huge surprise to you, but I am not immune from this. I deal with this all the time, kind of every day since I started here. Interesting. <laughs> but, you know, there's actually a, a picture I have that actually kind of, kind of reminds me of the way to go forward. It's this picture here. It's a gift from my wife. And so you got a picture of the lion, and it's be strong and courageous, for the Lord is with you wherever you go. Now, it's a great reminder but it's actually paraphrasing a verse from the book of Joshua, the Old Testament book of Joshua. Uh, Joshua 1.9 is actually a fairly famous verse. And Joshua 1.9, it fully says this. This is my command. Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So that was the command given to this guy named, any guesses? Joshua. Come on, that was an easy one. Right. That was the command given to Joshua. Now, Joshua is kind of an interesting character. Because Joshua, when he receives this command, he finds himself in a position he did not expect. Right. Joshua had been part of the millions of Hebrews who had been following Moses, right? so going way back towards the beginning of the Old Testament. And these people followed Moses because these people believed that Moses was leading them where God wanted them to go, that they had been promised this amazing destination, this amazing life that they could have. And they'd been traveling for many years. And everyone had always assumed that Moses was going to be the one to lead them all the way in, that he was the guy who had the connection with God that was going to get them there. But after traveling for many years, as they begin to turn towards the ultimate destination, Moses' time is up. Moses dies. And Joshua finds himself where he never expected to be, the man in charge. And he doesn't know exactly where the destination is. He has kind of a general idea of what direction to head in, but he doesn't know exactly where to go. And so he realizes that in order to reach that destination for himself and those who are relying on him, he simply has to do the best he can. He has to start traveling in generally the correct direction, trusting that God will fill in the gaps along the way. Now, it's interesting. We're never told that Joshua is fearful. We never, the, the writing never says he's fearful. But I'm just going to think that if one of the first things he gets from God is... <laughs> Don't be afraid. Be courageous. Joshua was afraid because he didn't know where he was going. He didn't know exactly where he was going. He had a general idea. And he knew enough to know that this journey ahead was not going to be easy. That the time they had spent with Moses was hard. The time ahead of them was going to be harder. And so now he is the one responsible for leading all these people to that thing that God had promised. And it would be filled with obstacles. And he would be tempted to be fearful. And at times, at times, it would feel like it was going wrong. It would feel like this can't possibly be it. If God loves me, it wouldn't be this hard, right? At times, he was going to be feeling that way. And he would be tempted to be discouraged. So at the outset, he's reminded that, yes, you will, be, you will be in situations that make you feel like you should be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. It's all going to be okay. But as he went through all those emotions, he can't let it paralyze him. But he has to keep moving forward. So what he does is he needs to start moving in generally the right direction. 
So what he does is that he organizes the people and he says, you know what? We're not going to let uncertainty paralyze us. We're going to start moving and we're going that way. And we trust that as we go along, God will show us the right thing to do. Now, here's the thing, though. When he says we're going that way, they can already see a problem. There's a huge river that way that's too big to cross. But Joshua says that I believe that's the way we're supposed to go, and I believe that God's going to give us a way through that. So now, what could he do? As he looked at this raging river, in fact, we, we know from the time of year that this is documented to have happened, it would have been just after the rainy season. So the water would have been flowing fast. It would probably be overflowing its banks. And as they looked to that, they could have said, well, God said he'd make a way, so let's have a seat right here on the side of the bank. We'll just wait. And when God clears it all up, we'll start moving. But that doesn't seem to be how God generally works. It seems like God looks to us to make steps first. And then he starts to fill in the gap. He asks us to have faith to take the step that we can. And so for Joshua, this is the command. When you reach the banks of the Jordan River, take a few steps into the river and stop there. In other words, don't just walk up to the edge of the scary river. Step into it a little bit. Now notice it doesn't say rush forward with abandon, ignoring everything around you. But it says take a few small steps of faith. And as they do that, they step carefully, they step intentionally, the flow of the river begins to change. And they're able to pass to the other side. And that was the beginning of Joshua's time as the leader. And that was the beginning of the journey that led him and those with him to the destination that God had said was available. That was the beginning of a journey to a life that they eventually arrived at that they would have completely missed if they had never taken those first few scary steps to start the journey. And I, I truly believe that that sort of path is available to us, that that's the process for us to achieve the kind of life that Jesus has, has promised, that you know, just as Joshua was given a promised destination that he knew generally which way to go, but didn't know exactly how to get there. We've all been given a promised destination, that we started out with Jesus saying that, I have come so you could have life to the full, a rich, meaningful life. And the way to get to our destination is to do what Joshua did. Not wait for the entire path to be clear. Not wait for every obstacle to be cleared. But instead, start moving towards our destination. Take the steps that we can. Even if we're not clear on exactly what that destination is going to look like for each of us. Because I think that, I think that a key part of finding our individual destination, and, and I, I kind of want to really kind of point that out, that that life that Jesus promises of this life that is rich and full and meaningful, won't look exactly the same for each one of us. Right? There's a path for each one of us. There's a destination for each one of us. Its description will be generally the same, full, rich, and meaningful, but the specifics of that destination for you is different than it is for me. And the thing we've got to be careful of is that we can get into such a rush to reach our personal destination that we keep trying to figure out too many details. And, it, and we've got to be willing to not get so focused on trying to find the shortest perfect route to our destination that we completely misread our destination. Because there's a good chance that that destination for you is very different than you think it's going to be. Ask me how I know. All right? Your life can go in an incredibly different direction than you expected. 
And so it's willingness to move generally in the correct direction. But, but that's kind of a funny thing. How do I know what generally the correct direction is? If I don't know where I'm supposed to be in the, in the end anyhow, how do I know what generally the right direction is? Well, Jesus gives us a hint. Remember that at the end of Jesus' earthly ministry, he boiled kind of the whole Bible down to largely one command. Love others as I have loved you. In other words, he dedicated his life to helping the lives of others, changing the lives of others, giving hope in the lives of, the, of others. So if that's the hint and you don't know where to start, there are some really clear places to start. Volunteer at a nonprofit. Right? Take some of your time, and I know we're all busy, but take some of your time and volunteer at something that does something meaningful to you. And be willing to invest in other people's lives. You know, over this year and the years to come, we're going to be ramping up more and more activities here with the goal of impacting lives. Volunteer here as we step out to do more things. And each and every one of us has a relationship with our neighbors, our family, and our friends. I can't imagine there isn't any of us who don't. My grammar's all wrong there. I, can't, I have to imagine that all of us, I've had too many negatives there. I imagine that all of us have relationships with somebody who needs help. Right? We all know people who need help. Be willing to help. Do what you can. And, and the thing that's so funny is that we can be paralyzed out, out of fear that it's just going to be too big. Sometimes it can actually be something quite small that can make a huge difference. I mean, think about in the early days of COVID that older people who had health issues who couldn't go to the grocery store. The value of just running to the grocery store for someone could make a huge difference. Right? Giving someone a ride who maybe can't drive at night but needs to be somewhere can make a huge difference. So I think that that's the right direction for all of us. But here's the key thing, is that we need to be willing to stretch ourselves, that as we start to step out in that kind of right direction, we'll be tempted to do the things that are really easy for us. And I think it's really worth saying that, you know, I'm going to push myself just a little past what's easy for me. Again, taking the Joshua story, those first couple steps in the river had to be terrifying but it was the steps they could take. It was a little bit more than they were comfortable with. And I, I think that path is true for all of us. And just to quickly share with you my path to here, and I'll make it short, I promise, don't worry. No slideshows, nothing like that, right? Um, but you know, the path that led me here looked nothing like what I expected. That you know, a number of years ago, uh, Bai and I were going to a, ch a church in Florida, a larger church, like four or 500 people, and I was just having this kind of discontent. That I just felt like I, was, I should be doing something more. I didn't know what to do. And after one particular Saturday night of feeling a great deal of discontent, we go to church the next Sunday morning, and as we arrive, the uh, church service is kind of a special service. The people on stage are prison inmates, like literally prison inmates, not former inmates, prison inmates, who had actually gotten uh, special permission to come to church that day. And they shared that uh, due to the ministry of a guy in our church, not our church's ministry, but a guy in our church, that they had had their lives dramatically changed. They'd found a relationship with God, that uh, they were healthier from their addictions, and they just thought that was, just wanted to share that that had been done. And I'm like, well, I don't know anything about prison ministry, but let me see if I can do something. All right, so I tracked down the guy, who did it? And I walked up and I said, <laughs> his name was uh, Murphy. I was like, Murph, I don't know anything about prison ministry. Can I help? And he goes, well, here's what we do. We, we do a 12-step thing that's kind of, a, kind of an AA morph that's also got a little spirituality in it and so forth. I go, I don't know anything about 12-step. Can I help? And I started going to Florida State Prison with him. And we were doing recovery work. And I got to see lives transformed by that from both the spiritual side as well as the recovery side. I saw the power of the 12 steps. First, I saw them in other people's lives, and then I embraced those same principles 
in my own life and realize that it goes farther than you can imagine. And we did that for a time until Bonnie and I moved from Florida back up to Laconia. And I didn't really know what to do because I didn't really have a connection with the, the prison system around here. Well, one particular day, we were making a donation to a food a drive, excuse me, a clothing drive. While I'm there, I run into a guy who says, hey, you know, they're looking for kind of a spiritual program in Belknap County Jail. You, if you know anybody could do something like that, let us know. I'm like, well, I can do that. And so we went. Brian and I started going on Saturdays to Belknap County Jail, basically repeating the program that we had seen in Florida. And then that ran its course. We moved down here to Warner, or yeah, down here to Warner. And um, I experienced a lot of discontent, in case you're wondering, by the way. Um, and, and, and I was just like, man, I don't, you know, I don't think th th things doesn't, well, not alone. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to know I'm not alone. That's it. Yeah. Um, but you know, it was just this kind of discontent. It's like, I feel like we should do, we be doing more and I don't know what to do. So we started volunteering at what is now Warner Connects and we volunteered for quite some time, did what we could. Um, and one of the things, but we were there for a while, and then I had this rapid set of things happen around Christmas time. That uh, Warner Connects would have a get together with the people who had supported them throughout the year, which is kind of like a little mini Christmas lunch. And I got to meet Robin, right? Who goes to this church that I didn't really know anything about. And then, um, like the next day, my neighbor across the street, uh, who's older and has vision issues, uh, used to volunteer to help clean the church. And I was talking to her, and she goes, well, I'm supposed to go help clean the church today, but with the snow, I don't feel comfortable driving. I'm like, well, I can drive you. And I got to meet Kitty, and I talked to Kitty for a long time. And then the next day, the Warner Christmas Project is going on. And Bonnie and I are like, well, we can pull some kids' names and buy some Christmas gifts. And I got to meet Ginger. So in like two, three days, a church where I'd never met anyone, all of a sudden I'd met three people, and we're like, well, maybe God's trying to tell us something. Then we came here, and we got involved, and then we got really involved, sort of thing. <laughs> yes, I did, yeah. And the thing is that all those things combined to put me here. Now, keep in mind, that's the short version, right? There were a thousand wrong turns, and there were a thousand things we tried that didn't work out, and there were a thousand things we did that went nowhere, but all the things that were supposed to happen did. And what ends up happening, you know, in my life is that for the first time in my life, I know I'm exactly where I'm supposed to be. Doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing. And what that does for me is that I get to be a bigger part of what God is doing than I ever thought was possible. That literally all started with, I don't know how to do that, but do you want someone who can help? That's where it begins if you don't know what to do. And God works through that, and God brings transformation through that. And the key is don't limit ourselves to the things we think we can do. I, knew, I had never been on the lock side of a prison. It changes your outlook. Right? It changes your outlook. And you start to realize how good your life really is. And that changes a lot of things. You know? And so, as we get ready to kind of wrap up, you know, throughout this series, kind of the person we've quoted the most often is the Apostle Paul. So as we wrap up, I want to quote him one more time. Paul says, Now all glory to God, who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Right? Jesus has offered this life to us that he describes to all of us, right? This life that is full and is meaningful and is impactful and is purposeful. But to do that, we can't just wait for it to show up. We've got to start moving in the right direction. And I am convinced that no matter what stage of life you're in, there is room to move in a direction that makes a bigger difference in our lives. And the thing to remember is that you know, we can get so caught up in the fact that we think impactful, you know, is, is, you know, is Billy Graham, right? That, you know, there are just thousands of people out there, 
You know, or it's got to be Google where you're working in the millions. It might be one. But for that one, it makes all the difference. Impact and purpose is not measured by numbers. It's measured by life change. Our own and those we're willing to invest in. So let's just be willing to take that step, be willing to be a little bit scared, and just see what God does.